and festive Diwali Festival of Light. Festival of Light over Darkness. And we're double checking to make sure that the signed language interpreter voice is coming through. We're having some technical issues at the moment. Give us just a second. Please bear with us. Kavita here, just checking in with the audience, making sure you can hear us. Thank you. I will restart my introduction. Let me give you a big welcome to our webinar for this evening. I am Kavita, president of the California Association of the Deaf. Before we start, I would like to take a few moments to wish you all this week, myself, as an Indian person, am celebrating a festive Diwali and a Happy New Year. And so we wish you happiness and glory, prosperity and blessings. Tonight, I am thrilled to introduce to you Marla Hattrack our committee chair. She will be our moderator for this evening. Our speaker tonight will be introduced by Marla. So Marla, take it away. This is Marla speaking. Good evening, folks. I am Marla Hattrack. This evening, we are thrilled to have our eighth webinar our ninth and final webinar for the year will be next month. Before we get going, I do want to mention that the California Association of the Deaf will be having a symposium on December 3rd. That symposium is titled Autism Colon From Trauma to Transformation. And it will be a hands-on type of webinar. And our very own Julie Rems Smario will be facilitating that workshop. She will lead us through group conversations, group discussions, and other activities. Please keep an eye out for our flyer announcement so that you may register for that workshop. Okay, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Mallory. Mallory is an audiologist. And we are thrilled to have an audiologist that is familiar with auditory deprivation. Auditory deprivation is in her title. And she will talk about the concept of auditory deprivation in deaf children focused on audiologists. She wasn't at first comfortable with the word language deprivation and realized that there was a gap there. So in noticing that there's a gap, Mallory decided to address the gap. With that, we will welcome Mallory to share her professional perspective on this issue. Before I transition to Mallory, she will be presenting for about 20 to 30 minutes. Then we'll take a break. During the break, you have a chance to type in your questions. You can ask them online at Facebook. Uh, and we will go ahead and open the Q&A box for another 20, 30 minutes after that and interact with you. Okay, Miss Mallory, are you Evan? Ready, over to you. And this is Mallory Evan speaking. Thank you so much, Marla, for that introduction. I am thrilled to present to the California Association of the Deaf audience this evening. I think it's critical to have dialogue about audiologists and a change in the mindset about hearing or auditory deprivation in deaf children. I will expand on that mindset transformation uh, that we can produce ourselves in order for deaf children to thrive in their language acquisition as well as their lifelong education. 
Next slide, please. So when developing this presentation, I did have parents in mind. You will see a few slides that are parent specific. However, nothing has changed for the sake of this presentation. I think it's important to focus on the parent component and challenge the thinking typically inherent when it comes to language acquisition, when it comes to hearing development as well. And uh, I'll leave that question there on the screen to sit with you for a moment. So my question for parents is on the screen. And that question asks, when the audiologist first identified your child as deaf, what is the information that you remember the most? That question typically tends to have similar responses. I've been told a lot about parents hearing about hearing technology. But the most important answer I get, which is really touching, is not a single word that they remember from the audi audiologist versus the feeling, that sense of receiving bad news. That sense and, uh, and expressions that the audiologists make that seem somewhat somber, that make parents concerned and worried about what they will be told. And parents remember how audiologists felt during that conversation. And I think that's an important consideration for us to keep in mind as audiologists when we interact with parents. We do need to improve how we address the information with parents because we are transferring that deficit mentality to parents in terms of the deafness that their child has. And that's not what we want to do. I'm not saying it's intentional, but what I am saying is that we can work to develop more compassion and having that compassion sometimes makes things more sad. And so we don't want to leave parents with that deficit feeling when they initially start that journey with their deaf child. Next slide, please. Audiologists are part of the medical home. Now that term comes from EDI, E-H-D-I, Early Hearing Detection Intervention. Really, the medical model focuses on which professional is in touch with the parents. As audiologists, we are included in that medical home. We also have power, but within reason. Our interaction with parents is, is heavy and weighty. Parents look up to the audiologist as the expert. And so we want to be cautious on how we share that information. Okay, next slide, please. I want to talk about language and modality bias.
This is typically for audiologists. Audiologists do focus on a hearing system. Of course, because that is our specialty, we are audiologists. We are professionals that focus on audio or sound. And we focus on providing access to sound for the purpose of instilling speech. Because of that, it means we already have an inherent bias. It indicates that we have a preference for spoken language because we focus on the audio stimula stimulation as the primary mode of the brain to receive that information of the world around it. Next slide, please. This slide is a critical slide. It's easy for audiologists to be involved in linguistic discrimination. You see it on the slide. There's a small quote there from Dr. Laura Ann Petito. The quote there says, the brain does not discriminate between spoken and signed languages. People do. And I'd have to say that that statement is at the crux of it all. It's right at the point. There are many assumptions made. There are many beliefs within the professional's mind that sign language is processed in a different location than auditory or spoken language. And that is not true. All types of language are processed in the mind, in the temporal lobe. So it's important for us to have the correct type of framing because our biases can affect our interactions. Many audiologists ask for parents to start with speech and sound, and if the child does not succeed, to add sign language later. However, we understand that the critical window for language acquisition stays the same regardless of the mode of language, whether it's spoken or signed. And that critical window is between the ages of birth to three. That is the time for exposure and immersion into signs. And if that is not done between those ages, it could cause significant delays. And it could ha cause children that do not have native skills, fluency in any language. So we have to be careful with misframing, with misrepresenting information, and perpetuating those misinformations. Next slide, please. This slide talks about bias. There are different types of bias. Now, I want to point out we all, each and every one of us have bias. I have my own biases. I certainly do. However, there are different levels of bias or stages of bias. Some are implicit. We don't even know we have them. Uh, some, we, we, we don't see that they're there because we're unconscious about them. Some of our biases, we know they exist but we don't recognize them in ourselves sometimes. There are other biases that we know exist. We know we are biased in that direction. And when we try to introspect and self-assess, we're more aware of them. There is a stage of proficiency where one is 
unconsciously aware on how to address bias. Uh, they just don't put a lot of work into it, but are able to address it. And that is the goal for us, to become culturally sensitive, culturally, culturally competent as well in these areas. Next slide, please. This is a question for the audience. Is auditory deprivation the cause of language delays or is it the lack of accessible language input? Which could it be? I want to delve further into auditory deprivation. which is used, not commonly used in the spoken or hearing world. In that world, there exists the concept of hearing. And really, when I say auditory depriva deprivation, it's a misnomer. It's not accurate for many reasons. Because we're not talking about not hearing the environment, a lack of capturing the sound, or not hearing other sounds, what we are talking about specifically is spoken language, not hearing or being able to discriminate speech or sounds that are produced by speech. That is auditory deprivation. There's an assumption that auditory deprivation causes language delay. That shows a belief that a person must have hearing to pick up or learn language. And that's the bias that it reflects. And we know that that's not the case. That's not necessarily the truth. We at this point know that there are tons of deaf people that have never, ever, ever had access to auditory speech. Yet they pick up concepts, they have their own language, without any access to hearing spoken language. They have developed fully. We need to recognize the concept that auditory deprivation is somewhat of a misnomer. Next slide, please. I've noted on the slide a couple studies. I'm not gonna get into it the details of these studies. Uh, it's quite dense material for this time of the afternoon. However, there are several studies that have been performed in relation to these two topics that are on the slide. Executive function, decreased executive function, excuse the interpreter, uh, you see on the slide there. by Davidson et al., Cronenberg et al., and Castellanos et al. Those researchers identified that yes, deaf children, well, I should say some, some deaf children exhibited de decrease in executive function. Now, keep in mind, they found more relevance with language skills. More of the issues having to do with the decrease in executive functions had to do with language issues, with language proficiency, lack of language proficiency affecting their memory, uh, their visual memory. If it was a, a smaller child who uses uh, assistive uh, devices, uh, like hearing aids or implants, but they were all impacted in different ways. Those studies didn't show a strong indication on the cause or the effect, better said. Being due to auditory deprivation, that wasn't necessarily the case. Instead, 
the issues of decreased uh, executive function had to do more with a lack of language. In the next study that I have on the slide by Hall et al. in 2017, reinforced the understanding that it's a lack of accessible language that causes deaf children to struggle with those executive function skills. And I believe that it's easy to confuse language deprivation with auditory deprivation if you are of the belief that you must have hearing or access to audio in order to pick up language or in order to learn language. I don't believe that this is something intentionally done by the audiology profession. I don't believe it's an intentional misinformation. However, I do believe that the profession of audiology itself um, is providing incorrect information. We are responsible to continuously grow and improve our training. We have evidence-based practices that we need to acknowledge and recognize. We need to understand that auditory deprivation is not a thing in the way it's framed. Auditory deprivation doesn't automatically mean that a child won't acquire language. That's not what it means. Auditory deprivation might make it tougher for a child to acquire language. I'd say that's true. But in general, it is not a deterrent to acquiring language. Next slide, please. You can see my next question on the slide already. Oh, I... Uh... Should wait for the comments on this one, yeah. This one really gets the comments going. Are audiologists qualified to make recommendations about language acquisition or educational programs? Yikes. <laughs> I'd say the answer is, it depends. Honestly, it depends. If an audiologist takes additional coursework, supplemental coursework related to their language development, uh, if they take educational focused courses, then my response in that case would be yes. I think it's critical to understand that a majority, maybe 90% of audiologists, uh, audiology grad programs do not include any components on education or language acquisition within the training program. Those don't exist. Those topics might be touched upon in a single class, in a single lecture, maybe when getting a, your bachelor's degree in your undergraduate program, they might just be superficially touched upon, but there's nothing in depth. So if an audiologist doesn't have that supplemental training, I would say it's not appropriate for that audiologist to make language acquisition or educational program rep, uh, uh, rec recommendations at all. I would advise parents to exercise extreme caution when taking in those recommendations from an audiologist when it comes to language acquisition and educational programs especially a clinical audiologist, they are not within the educational system. It is not their field. So parents should not be going to a doctor's office and asking doctors about an educational placement. So if you don't do that from a doctor, why would you expect that from a clinical audiologist? How could you expect them to make those educational or language recommendations? Next slide, please. This is a really neat quote from C. 
C'est Cora et Smith. In a time when linguistic diversity is encouraged and considered an asset, it is astonishing that many professionals in the field of deaf education, speech pathology, and audiology still adhere to outdated beliefs about bimodal bilingualism for deaf and hard of hearing children. Wow, what a quote. Outdated beliefs, which, which is true. There are research and articles that tell us that the mind processes language at the same place regardless the modality. You can have it all. You can have both. And so I believe that we harm deaf children if we do not address this issue. Next slide, please. Audiology as counseling. Ooh, okay, okay. Audiologists are top notch at providing information. We love to bombard parents with information. We know how to talk about an audiogram. We get into the nitty gritty of this decibel means that. Uh, the chart is saying this. Uh, and we talk about all the different parts of the audio, uh, audiogram. We talk about hearing acuity. Uh, we talk about assistive listening devices. We bombard parents so much. We love talking about hearing technology. We are the experts with information and counseling. However, I have to be honest, as audiologists, we suck at the interactive counseling part. We do. <laughs> we don't recognize when parents are glazed over. With that first message, your baby is deaf. Parents have checked out. Whatever we say after that, they're not receiving. They're not getting that information. They're still glossed over on, my child is deaf. And we're talking about, we have this, we have that, we have this program. You can get this, you can get that. We have it all for you. And the parents are still thinking, deaf, my child. And Parents and deaf children for many years still feel like they don't understand because the audiologists haven't recognized that the parents weren't in a place where they'd be receptive to the information that was being shared with them. There's a disconnect. Whew. I think that's tough because as audiologists, sometimes audiologists think, well, I told the parents plenty of times they should know this information already. But again, audiologists are failing to acknowledge where the parents are in their journey. When are they receptive to taking in the information that is being shared? That's where we fail. Keep in mind, if we want the information to stick with the parents the most, we talk about hearing technology, we talk about hearing aids, we talk about cochlear implants. Audiologists make recommendations when it comes to spoken language and at times even when it comes to sign language. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me ask you, how do audiologists provide information to parents regarding auditory stimulation? There's a screenshot on the slide uh, from a presentation 
taken from YouTube. But the question I'm asking you tonight is, what's wrong with this framing? Do you see the statement on the screen? Ears are the doorway to your brain. Let me ask you, what do you think is wrong with that sentence? What does that statement imply? Yes, next slide, please. Here's a visual from another presentation. They have a door right next to the ears. So if the doors are open, your ears are open. If the doors are closed, your ears are closed. If your doors are open, the sound makes it in your ear all the way to your brain. And hey, you're great. But if the doors to your ears close, does that mean the connection to your brain closes and your mind no longer receives stimulation? Is that really the case? That's what that statement implies. That's what that means. That's the framing it gets across. That is dangerous because it can scare parents. It can terrify their parents and make them think, if my child can't hear, they'll never develop. They won't be able to use their brains. They won't be able to think, what do I do if my child doesn't hear? We don't want to scare parents into making impulsive choices about their deaf child. This type of framing produces a false priority for the auditory system as the most important out of the five senses, which we know is not the case. The mind, the brain, receives information in a variety of ways through different inputs, through different senses. And I understand and I agree the auditory system is important to pick up a spoken language. That is true. I'm not saying that hearing sound is not important for learning language, but I'm also not saying what is on the screen. What's on the screen says ears are the door to the brain. It doesn't say ears are a door to the brain, as in more door doors exist. The framing on this video makes it seem like ears are the only way to get to the brain. That's what's dangerous. And it's also very, very inherently biased statement. Next slide, please. When we talk about language opportunities for deaf children, people who support hearing and spoken languages naturally tend to focus on early hearing technology use. For people that are familiar with the EDI system, we have a newborn hearing screening system. That has several milestones, a one month screening, uh, a three month screening, and also early interventions at six months of age. Now, this is not a criticism. I'm just sharing information on how the system is and how it operates. Of course, the focus is on hearing, on hearing acuity, hearing levels. And there's a lot of expansion about sound, hearing, spoken language, function of the ear, uh, how to develop spoken language. There's a lot of focus and a lot of expansion and a lot of talk about that.
Some audiologists also mention American Sign Language. I know there's a belief that audiologists don't. But if the audiologist does bring up ASL, the question then becomes, how do they bring it up, right? If it's an audiologist that centers and is familiar with ASL and is familiar with the deaf community, uh, then they may do that. Others might not expand on that. Some audiologists will refer parents to a center, a deaf agency, if those parents express an interest in ASL as an option. And so if parents express uh, an interest in learning, they get referred to another agency, another community-based organization. But when making that referral, an audiologist also makes a judgment and is showing parents that they don't value ASL as much as they do spoken language. Now, why do I say this? If you look at Children's Audiology Center, they tend to have a team of professionals. They are comprised of an audiologist, a speech uh, pathology, pathologist, a social worker, and AVT, uh, ENT, ear, nose, and throat specialist, excuse the interpreter, and there's a team of individuals that comprise that team. However, one individual is lacking. Where's the ASL specialist? If they have a hearing and speech therapist, they have those specialists, why don't they have an ASL sign language specialist? That clearly demonstrates that there's not enough value in ASL to them to add that component to their team. And so that's why audiologists possibly focus more on hearing language than they do on American Sign Language. This demonstrates systemic bias, which is something that we want to think about. We want to think about how to break down or transform those systemic barriers and break down the system's inherent biases. For multimodal language, one needs to focus on early access to language stimulation. We can discuss hearing technology and how hearing technology can support a child in language acquisition. That is definitely something that should be included in that conversation. We can also discuss how language can be acquired visually, auditorily, kinetically. There are different ways to access language. And providing opportunities for deaf children to be able to acquire language. Next slide, please. As I wrap up, I have discussion questions that I'd like to ask parents. I'm curious, what materials would you like to see change and how audiologists share information with you? Give it a minute, give it some thought, think about your lifelong experience and reflect on it. If you could change something about your interaction with the audiologist and how they shared information, what would it be? Uh, and so that's a question for everyone. I think it's about time for Q&A. So we will open up the floor to our viewers.
This is Marla speaking. Wow. That was as good as we've ever had. I found myself nodding the whole way, saying, yes, of course, of course, of course. Before I share the audience questions, which we do have some, give me just a second. I've got a friend sending me a message on my, on my phone. They just text me, so excuse me about that. Uh, I've been asked to facilitate the questions, but I forgot to mention that Mallory was one of a cohort of professionals who have continuously advocated and have included ASL to Louisiana, uh, no, LAUSD, Los Angeles School District, and they passed a $5 million grant to include ASL in the curriculum to create bilingual curriculum. So congratulations, Mallory. Are you ready for our audience questions? Mallory says, thank you so much, Marla. Uh, Marla says, yes. First question, if you're ready. Okay, so I think we tried to combine a question here. Somebody said, with all you know, with what's happening in the school districts being not right, what message do you send to other audiologists who are also advocates like yourself? Mallory speaking. That is a great question. And my response to that is, I try to encourage audiologists, for one, to have an open mind. It is our obligation as professionals to meet students where they're at. Students don't have the onus to meet us where we're at. They're not supposed to fit into us. We're supposed to meet them and fit into them. I think it's important if we are an audiologist working in a school district, that means you're a part of deaf education. You have the responsibility to understand the needs of a deaf student. And you also have the responsibility to advocate for your deaf students. I'd say you can't enter this field without a willingness to be an advocate, without a willingness to engage and fight for your students. If you don't have that aspect within you, I'd recommend find another field. Find a different profession. Marla speaking. That is a good response. I have a follow-up question from another individual. That question says, you're familiar that audiologists tend to lead IEP meetings. Do you think that's appropriate? Mallory speaking. No, I don't believe that to be appropriate. The administrators or the designee should be the individual who guides the IEP. Audiologists should be on an IEP team. I myself attend IEPs probably more than I should. I, I go to many. But in that session, I am an attendee. I am a member of the team. And I don't consider myself to have any more power than anyone else does. And an audiologist should never take the lead on a meeting. An audiologist should never influence the team regarding placement decisions. And I know that audiologists are extremely guilty of doing just that. Say, for example, the team is considering a placement of a student in a bilingual program, but the student has a lot of residual or remaining hearing, the audiologist will speak up and say, that student has plenty of residual hearing. They don't need an ASL program. Ooh, that gets the hairs on my neck to stand up. And I think that is one of the worst statements an audiologist can make. And then some audiologists use words like rely. Oh, they'll have to rely on ASL. But no one says that about languages in general. We don't say, oh, that person relies on English. 
So there's no need for audiologists to use that type of language. ASL doesn't have a hearing acuity requirement. Anyone can pick up ASL, even hearing people can. Hearing levels or hearing acuity has nothing to do with ASL, with American Sign Language. So we need to stop those types of decision-making processes where the placement decision is on the audiologist or the audiogram. That is the wrong type of placement decision-making. This is Marla. There's a follow-up question to that. The question is, if the audiologist isn't the appropriate member of the team to lead the IEP meeting, then who is the appropriate person to make recommendations on educational placement for the deaf student? Mallory speaking. I'd say that really depends on your school district. Hopefully they have a program specialist and that program specialist uh, for deaf education should be there. I would say it requires someone knowledgeable in deaf education that has worked with a variety of placements. If there is no program specialist, then a deaf ed teacher themselves could, be, could take on that role. And there are other members of the team. In the reality, it's a team decision. Parents must be included in the decisions. And even more importantly, the student themselves. I encourage students when they have a level of understanding, I encourage them to be a part of the IEP team and to take guidance and control of their own education. But to answer the question, who is the appropriate person to make placement recommendations? The answer is a person who has the competency, the knowledge, the skills, and experience in deaf education. Marla speaking. Okay, Mallory. Earlier in your presentation, you had mentioned that based on audiologists' conduct, they are inherently biased towards audio. How can we fix that? That seems to be a consistent bias. How do we address it so that they don't develop it in the first place? Mallory speaking, that is an amazing question. Also an area that I'm intensely passionate about. Talking about university programs, they never consider including anything about deaf culture, American Sign Language, deaf education specifically, uh, audiology programs are very clinical. I should say that most audiologists don't work within the deaf community. Most audiologies, audiologists don't work with deaf people who use American Sign Language. The number that do is extremely small. Audiologists aren't exposed to the deaf community in the first place. Now, that's not an excuse, and it's not good enough. The truth is that any audiologist that wants to become a pediatric audiologist, I believe, should be required to learn more. They should have interactions with the deaf community, uh, with deaf education. And I think it's important for university audiology programs to embed those components from the start. Now, for people who already work in the field, we have PD professional development, trainings, workshops, lectures, and so on, having to do with language bias, ableism, uh, other types of isms, uh, and issues that impact deaf children. And I think it's important for us as audiologists to take those trainings. But I will reinforce that I believe it starts at the university level with the university programs. I hope that we can figure out a way to impact the university programs for new audiology students coming into those programs 
to have a much more receptive and open mindset to the field. Marla speaking. Maybe the California Association for the Deaf can guide conversations in that direction. I will reach out to university programs. I'm not going to wait too long, right? I need to reach out tomorrow to talk to them, to develop that component in their program. Thank you for mentioning that, Mallory. Let me get my bearings here. Okay, I have some bad news. I clicked on my laptop and it closed. I'm not sure what happened. Kavita, you are going to have to look at the questions. There was another question. Uh, Kavita, there's a couple more questions. You'll have to come on the screen. We want to make the most of the time that we have here with Mallory. Um, give us a minute. Kavita speaking. Hi again, everyone. Wow, I've been watching your presentation, Mallory, and mm, stunning. Okay, let me get to the questions the audience had for you. One of the questions says, during the pandemic, did you see an increase in more audiologists? Like, was there a higher demand for audiologists? Mallory speaking, not that I'm aware of, no. During the pandemic, it was really tough for several months. Everything was shut down. Audiology isn't the kind of service that works too well online. <laughs> I mean, there are ways to get it done, but you can't do it online. <laughs> you have to be in person for the audiology exam. I wouldn't say there was an increased demand. However, I would say that there was a backlog of appointments because nobody could schedule appointments until the COVID restrictions were lifted. And so there was a delay. We were backed up. There are many parents still waiting for an appointment for their child. People are scrambling all over to get caught up at the moment. And I believe that the field of audiology was also impacted by people who exited and left the workforce and haven't returned. There are a lot of vacant positions at the moment that haven't been filled. So that further delays other individuals from having appointments. So I wouldn't say necessarily that there was an increase in demand. However, there were impacts due to COVID. This is Kavita. Okay, this is a personal follow-up question for you, Mallory. I'd like to ask you, how can we, as deaf parents, as deaf individuals, how can we commit to seeing more audiologists serve more children? How can we enforce or encourage this from audiologists? Mallory speaking. I think it's important for maybe in the future working together, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm only, I'm not the only person in the world that thinks this way, but collaborations between audiologists and deaf professionals giving presentations to university programs, to uh, auditory program, audiologist programs, to those clinical programs. We've made some initial first steps, but I would prefer that the work be done with the inclusion of deaf professionals. Having deaf professionals there from the start, when there are conversations about making changes, the deaf professional should be there. I don't want deaf professionals to come in ad hoc at the end of a discussion when one realizes a change has to be made. Audiologists need 
need to best serve the needs of the community? And who would know that better than the community itself? So I believe that would be the starting point in order to impact change to this field. Kavita speaking, I agree. Mallory speaking, California Association of the Deaf can take the lead in this. Kavita says, I have a question from the audience. How can parents become more educated on these issues we've talked about tonight? Mallory speaking, I think the California Association for the Deaf is a fantastic resource for parents. I think this type of workshop is incredibly appropriate. Other organizations like ASCD, the American Society for Deaf Children, ASDC, has tons of information on this subject. There are also parent organizations that are out there as advocates for parents. There are parent-to-parent -parent supports. And you want to make sure that in those parent-to-parent -parent supports, you include Deaf individuals as well. I think anytime we talk about parent-to-parent -parent support, people forget to think about deaf parents. Of course, we value hearing parents. They have a different journey than deaf parents. However, deaf parents need to be a huge component of that as well. I think parents should demand their school districts to provide increased opportunities more opportunities for this type of parent education. One that Marla mentioned uh, is the recommendation we made to LAUSD. The superintendent of LAUSD said that part of the parent academy that was already in place at LAUSD would also set up a special section for parents of deaf children in order to provide lectures, trainings with topics specific for parents of deaf children. So I think the opportunity exists for parents to really prod their school districts and ask for this. Kavita speaking. I think it's fabulous to see the program being accepted there at LAUSD. It serves as a wonderful model for other districts to emulate. Maybe the California Association for the Deaf here, CAD, can help by becoming involved and make a coalition with CalEd. You had mentioned ASDC. Uh, we can partner together and invite the community of audiologists to this specific conversation so that audiologists themselves can improve their services to the public. Mallory speaking. Yeah, thanks for the reminder. I can't believe I forgot to mention an amazing resource. Khaled, hello, California Educators of the Deaf. Khaled, hello, I'm even on the board. My goodness, I can't believe I forgot that. I apologize. Thank you, Kavita, for bringing up Khaled. I would say that Khaled is an extremely wonderful organization for professionals in the deaf field. I think it's a wonderful resource for parents as well. because we do have a director for family engagement and involvement that is really trying to reach out and engage parents in the community. It's a place for parents to feel connected, where they could interact, learn, grow, gain insights, and thrive. Cal Ed is a fantastic resource too. Kavita here. Give me just a second. I'm looking at the board to see if there are any more questions. However, at the same time, I think we've run out of time. But Mallory, we're grateful for your presentation. Thank you for speaking with our audience tonight. Audience members, if you missed any portion of tonight's presentation, have no frets or concerns. We will be posting tonight's presentation online. And 
Mallory, let me ask you, is there any contact information you'd like to share in case anyone in the audience would like to reach out for you for further questions? Mallory speaking. I think I noted it on the last slide, but I'll give you my email. It's M-A-L-B-E-C-K-F-O-R-D at gmail.com. Again, M A L B E C K F O R D at gmail.com. Mal Beckford at gmail.com. You got it. This is Kavita. We will share it on the YouTube and Facebook channel in a minute. We will be giving that to our audience. But I must say, Mallory, thank you for your amazing and fabulous presentation. Today, was sponsored by Google and their product supports this platform. So we want to thank also Jermaine, who is the producer for tonight. We also want to thank the interpreter, whose name is Chris Cinciano, and the captioner, whose name is Darren, for joining us tonight. And of course, we want to thank Marla Hattrack for moderating this evening and also thanks to Miss Mallory Evans for presenting to us today and I hope you have a fabulous Diwali week folks have a good night Mallory speaking thank you so much you all have a good night as well